talks with Putin over the next few days. Of course, the free trade agreement with China, it's pretty much done and dusted. I spoke to the trade minister at the weekend at the APEC summit and he had some interesting views, not just on the agreement, which you can get a sense from him that uh, it's pretty much a fait accompli, but views on the rise of China and how Australia and the rest of the world needs to be uh, realistic about with the economic rise comes a, a broader increase in their power as well. Uh, we're an enthusiastic member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, 12 countries in the region trying to get a more seamless level of trade amongst one another, but we see that as ultimately becoming one of the building blocks for an Asia-Pacific wide agreement, right? So that uh, in the end, all of these other agreements that are taking place will all come together like bricks in a wall to create an, an Asia-Pacific one, which is what the Chinese are advocating. And we've been very enthusiastic about what can be done, should be done to facilitate that over the next 10 or 15 years. Are the Americans as enthusiastic as we are? Uh, or are they a bit reticent about having a China-led push on the, the trade front? Well, there's uh, always a bit of uh, two bulls in a paddock um, on some of these things, on a lot of things actually. But um, at the end of the day, the Americans uh, understand. They want to get the TPP away, I understand that. But they also have been um, strong supporters of ultimately seeing an Asia-Pacific uh, trade agreement, free trade agreement. So I don't think their objectives in any way conflict with the Chinese. What's your feeling on how the Chinese are seeing our position on their Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Because again, the Americans aren't convinced on that. They see that as a rival to their world, the US-led World Bank. Uh, we haven't signed up yet. Have you picked up any concern from the Chinese on that? Is it feeding into the free trade negotiations at all? No, it hasn't. Um, it hasn't at all. And, and in fact, uh, I've had discussions right up to Vice Premier level, uh, Politburo level, right, and um, openly discussed the bank. And they have said and made the point again and again that uh, we've got lots of time they're very, wish, very keen to engage on the governance requirements and I've responded by saying uh, we are keen. We are keen to join if the governance issues are dealt with in, in a sort of world's best practice way, uh, we will be there, um, we'll be there quickly and enthusiastically. It's hard to defi uh, divide the economic and trade space obviously with the increasing political and strategic clout, isn't it, when you're talking about China? And I guess that adds to the complexity of trying to negotiate this with the US, because for years they've had their IMF and the World Bank based in Washington. They've had strategic uh, advantages from having that. Now we're seeing China replicate a, a parallel architecture, I guess, on the economic front. Well, the way I look at it, you know, let's look at the reality. The reality is that um, China is a huge economy um, emerging or, or reinstating perhaps its traditional role in the world. Bear in mind over the last 20 centuries uh, the, the two top countries in the world, number one and two was China and India for 18 of the last 20 centuries. So in many ways you're starting to see um, the re-emergence of both those big countries. That's the reality. We've got to We've got to live with the reality and we've got to accommodate new institutions like the Asia, Asia Bank. Um, we've got to accommodate the new reality and, and with it does come power and authority. Uh, you know, it is somewhat competitive with other areas of power and authority around the world, but that's, that's the reality. Uh, we can, if we work together, and a lot of our work with the free trade agreement has been all about relationship building, building trust, right? so that uh, when there are issues, we can deal with them in a common sense way, understanding one another's points of view, having built the relationships and the trust that will enable close relationships. Do you, do you think some of the analysis in Australia misses the, the point, I guess, in the sense that the Chinese in your view, from what you're saying to me today, and, and you've expressed it many times before, they're pragmatic, aren't they, when it comes to the, the end result? Well, in the end, they're like the rest of us. They've got political imperatives. 
They've, they've taken 500 million people out of poverty. They've still got 700 million small farmers all over China. Um, it's a political imperative that they keep finding jobs, uh, developing their economy. I see the same, pre they've, they've got pressures on them of a profound nature to, in order to maintain social order, and they've got to keep delivering jobs and opportunities and that's why they're engaging I think in in all these agreements um, in APEC they are they, they need to for their own self-interest to develop their economy and engage with other economies and it's just um, it's human nature it is real politic and it's inevitable and we've got to accept that and make the most of it because we can gain a lot from their progress. A couple of questions to finish. On the free trade agreement, are you happy where things are at at the moment? It's obviously crunch time and uh, you're hoping for a signature by the end of the G20, I guess, or by the time President Xi is in Canberra. Are you happy where things are at? Uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased. I, I would like to have it locked away, obviously. I think we will shortly. I, I really do. Um, but we've got a couple of hurdles to, to jump yet. Uh, but it is that has got the potential of being a, 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 remarkably, a remarkably timely piece of work because China is moving from an industrial um, you know, infrastructure based economy to a services based. It's the only way with, with the massive growth of urbanisation, the only way they get jobs for all those former farmers is through the services industry. That's our sweet spot. We're 80% of services economy, we're knowledge based this whole agreement, uh, the new emphasis, it'll look after agriculture and it'll look to resources, but the big growth area is the emphasis that we are seeing within the document on uh, access for services, hundreds of services from Australia. And, and finally, you've heard some criticisms already from the opposition. Are you, uh, are you worried that you might face a bit of a, a campaign from, from some, if there is some labour mobility factor in this free trade agreement or I guess even if there's enhanced investment protocols are you worried that the, that the your political opponents might might question that well if they if they just play uh, you know a, a spoiling role without looking at the national interest uh, it'll play into our hands frankly you know that we've heard nothing but endless negativity on just about every issue that's been raised um, by us, except for the engagement in the Middle East. Just about everything else has been just a blanket no. If they adopt that same attitude towards this China free trade agreement, um, they will be the ones that suffer. This is fundamentally in the national interest. Uh, it's an excellent agreement. If we can finalise one or two key points, uh, we're going to really set Australia up and it won't for the decades it. ahead. It won't undermine employment prospects. I guess that's the thing for Australians. The whole point Australians. about this free trade agreement is to create jobs. If we don't have a living document which moves with the, the changing nature of, of China, um, then we will be left behind. We won't have the opportunities. But if we do move with the China's change, if we help them with their growth in services, it'll create endless opportunities for Australia, high value jobs, high paid jobs, and uh, knowledge based opportunities. That's, that is where we are you know, so well placed as a country to contribute. We can help China get those other 700 million people out of poverty and get them into a quality of life that we all enjoy. Mr Rob, thanks for your time.